is about some very recent work on video lectures. So very relevant to and arising out of the current COVID-19 situation. And then the session of talks that follows on is around the theme of responding to COVID-19 as well. So can we give Charles a really big and warm welcome? Um, I'm not sure this is a good substitute for what we would normally do, but I'm going to try it out. And I'm going to hand over to Charles, and I'm going to take myself away from here um, and look forward to your talk, Charles. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Anne, for that warm um, welcome. I need to see my um, PowerPoint, though. Do I, <clears throat> must I do something to activate it? It's there on my... Oh, hold on. Right, okay. Probably your um, background screen. There okay. we go. Great. <laughs> oh, um, just one more thing. Where are the controls for this? At the bottom, you should see okay, backwards. Yeah. Right. I am now part of your online lecturing culture. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, I. It is work in progress. Um, I thought it was an appropriate topic, though, for these reasons. First of all, um, the Open University, and especially your good selves, are, um, I think, a recognized leader in mobilizing new tools to remediate old practices. So that seemed to fit the topic well. Um, and there's certainly a COVID virtual education theme here. Um, so the topic is topical. And then finally, well, there's something kind of whimsically meta about lecturing on video lectures in the format of a video lecture. So I hope you can tolerate that, but I thought that was an intriguing possibility. I'm very happy to answer questions at the end. Um, I'm not trusting myself to monitor the chat window below. But if something urgent comes up, like you're too slow or you're too boring or whatever um, that I need to know, then please put it in capitals and um, I'll try and respond to that. I think the video lecture is very interesting as a topic because, well, it's disruptive, isn't it? Or it's potentially disruptive. After all, it dislocates participants in space but it also can dislocate them in time. And so the issues arise from this that are worth thinking about. Those disruptions um, that are disturbances to people's expected synchronies are interesting. And I think the consequences of commodifying the lecture into, as it were, a digital artifact also has potentially interesting impact. So basically, um, this talk is about some of the consequences of migrating the lecture to this medium. And I'm going to uh, go through these five themes. First of all, just make some comments about the status of the lecture in general as a pedagogical form. Secondly, give a little bit of theoretical context, in other words, make some uh, declaration of my own perspective in approaching this topic, which might help make sense of some of the things that I've chosen to do. And then three parts, which are a little bit more empirical. So talking about the individual video lecture as um, an episode requiring design of some kind. Uh, secondly, thinking about the modern fashion for lecture capture within higher education and how the video lecture integrates with educational practice more widely. And then finally, saying something about the potential of the lecture as a context for collaborative um, forms of learning, something I've personally been interested in for quite a long time. So um, let's start with um, a few thoughts about the lecture as an occasion, as an, as an episode, as a form of pedagogy. 
at some point, I'm not sure how it happened, but the word lecture seems to develop very negative connotations. Don't lecture me, he cries, or um, I asked her about lockdown and she gave me a lecture. I suspect even a child these days will associate the word lecture with something or someone that is aloof, long-winded, and possibly very boring. Now, I'm not sure I agree with this. and I have to confess um, a more positive uh, perception of this um, format. I've noticed I've started to flash in the screen, and I'm going to just leave it and, and suggest that if people find this annoying, I think you can run your mouse over the picture and it probably stops and freezes me, which is fine yeah. with me, but um, I, I'm going to leave it active. So um, what is it about the lecture that might be appealing? I think there is something that needs um, protecting. Uh, it says start my webcam. Well, I will start it. Okay. Um, there you are, back again. Um, there's something about uninterrupted speech or the pre presentation of an argument within un uninterrupted speech that is probably deserves to be protected. I mean, if I go to a wedding, it's the speeches that I look forward to. I think it's there's something you can learn about, perhaps in that instance, about, about people that comes out of giving someone the opportunity to do this. Yet for educationalists, maybe people like yourselves, it's more verbal exchange that we tend to celebrate. Well, um, yes, seminars are precious, of course, but seminars are participatory events. They're not expository events. And I don't think new ideas easily come from witnessing the kind of argy-bargy of expository discussion. I mean, what do we learn about politics from spending an hour watching Question Time? So there is a, a kind of skepticism about lecturing that we have to admit is active within the education community. And there's a long history of questioning the appropriateness of this form to good educational practice, from particularly from Alison King's famous um, contrast between sage on the stage and guide on the side. Biggs, Gibbs, Lorillard, many um, educationalists have argued uh, against the format. Here's a current example I lifted from um, a, a COVID um, piece by Tansy Jessup, who's the PBC for Education at Bristol. Um, she's talking about the totemic status of lectures. Anyone who's worked within an inch of higher education in the last 10 or 15 years will know that attendance at live lectures has dwindled dramatically since the installation of lecture capture, which records dulcet and droning tones of the lecture. And clearly, um, the dulcet and droning tones is a signal of Professor Jessup's uh, skepticism about the value of lectures and about the appeal of lecturers and lecturing. Now, interestingly, I think um, Jessup's piece is itself a lecture, really, although it's written down rather than spoken. And of course, exposition can be in text rather than in voice. But I want to suggest that something valuable is added um, by the human presence that we create when um, exposition is delivered in this kind of vocal form. Um, it's probably also worth uh, bearing in mind that we may have, some of us, a kind of professional attachment to the notion of the lecture because we've grown up, many of us, being lecturers, uh, and that's our sort of professional identity. Although it's interesting that recently the uh, identity of the lecturer has been somewhat rebranded. So now it's more likely that if you work in a university, you're going to be some species of professor rather than some species of lecturer. You're going to be an assistant professor or an associate professor or a full professor, a merited professor, distinguished professor, and so on. So 
um, I admit that there is skepticism and I admit that defending the lecture as a starting point is maybe going to be a kind of controversial position for uh, many of you. But all of this is kind of rather personal. It's my preferences uh, that define what might be a foundation for scrutinizing the video lecture. So maybe I should try and put my own position um, in a little bit more of a theoretical framework. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, um, I'll, I'll just try and do that. And that means um, going from the dulcet and droning toads to talk about the uh, so a socio-cultural perspective that I think the lecture and lecturing deserves um, it, 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 in, in the way in which we approach it. So here's a kind of personal unpacking of that perspective and the socio-cultural imperatives um, as, as they apply to learning and then how, is it, how it might relate to the lecture and to the particular um, species of lecturing that is the video lecture. Um, When I think about learning um, as a topic for research, and uh, indeed as a, as a form of practice, uh, I think in my own mind, I kind of organize research um, perspectives around this kind of three-way distinction, which I'll briefly articulate. Um, at the level that I think is most interesting and at which for me, the most interesting research is organized is what you might call the meso level, which are things that in in my mind exist as kind of acts of learning. They are cultural practices that have evolved for sense making and for moving knowledge forward. So they are things like being in a collaboration or exercising annotation, representing the world, performing knowledge, rehearsing material, and so on. And I like to think of these as acts of learning that are carried forward in people's lives from schooling to become maybe part of some workplace or professional identity, but also think of them as uh, cultural practices that have been inherited from or have evolved from simpler or more everyday forms of interaction with the world. So I think they have a, a natural authenticity as categories of learning, or cultural practices for exercising learning, as opposed to those approaches to learning which try to totalize um, what goes on in such acts of learning in terms of some underpinning basic fundamental categories of uh, for example, association, behaviorism or connections or computational processes, the kind of micro level of thinking about learning. And then at the other side, well, we have attention to the way in which the experience and elaboration of those acts of learning are embedded within curricula or within particular sites of educational practice like schools, museums, workplaces, and so on. So. I'm thinking about events at the meso level. And if we think about those, then it's at that point that you think, well, there are a couple of very fundamental learning experiences that are not quite in the same class, it seems. I'm thinking of relationships between people that have a tutorial quality where some kind of knowledge scaffolding is going on between one more experienced person and a less experienced person, or um, the expository relationship where something is being told. And it's these two things which seem not to be quite as participatory as the kind of um, cultural practices that I'm identifying in, in the list above. But I think I want to say that these must be thought about in the end as being other forms of social relationship, even though at first they may seem to have a, an asymmetrical quality. So the argument would be that as with the list um, above, the collaboration list as it were, these kind of relationships here um, do also have their 
genesis within, as it were, the domestic environment, so that um, the relationships that we recognize in education as having a tutorial quality are an echo of something that's taken place in, well, breakfast time conversations or whatever in, in that domestic environment. And similarly, the expository relationships that we celebrate in educational contexts um, have their origin within our tolerance as young people to the bedtime story or the telling of events um, that would be a natural part of domestic life. So they're culturally um, continuous in that sense. But the other point to make about them is that they are socially mediated. They are relationships. They are forms of exchange, I want to argue, that take place um, between people. So for someone thinking in these kind of terms, what is it that becomes interesting about the video lecture? How does the, a concern for the cultural nature of educational and learning practices fit with the video lecture? And how does um, a commitment to the sociality of learning fit with the video lecture? If they are social occasions, the tutorial and the lecture, in what sense does one take part in a lecture, for example? I'm going to turn to a different kind of source to um, uh, elaborate this point. I'm going to um, draw from something David Hare, the playwright, has written about lecturing um, uh, and in, in, in trying to make a link between his profession, theater, and what goes on in education. So here he is talking about theater. He says it depends upon engagement engagement between the action on the stage and the audience which attends. Screaming and shouting don't make a play, nor do sword fights. So he's making a very kind of Vygotskyan um, comment about the nature of um, the lecture, about performance and about participation. And I think it's asking us to conjure up what we might call a sort of implied dialogue. So if learning is empowered within this context, it's through our own willingness to find um, what he calls, I think in another quote, the unspoken reaction in the room. So lectures and plays are alike in relying for their vitality on the richness of the interaction between the performance itself and the thoughts and feelings created by the unspoken reaction in the room. Now, this kind of conversational perspective on the lecture maybe releases it from being a sort of narrowly passive didactic event. But how far do students relate to lectures in that way? How far do they find the unspoken reaction in the room, the potential for conversation or implied dialogue? And can the design of an exposition draw out that more participative relationship more effectively. Now let's call that relationship with David Hare, let's call it engagement. And evidently engagement can be achieved by simply demanding it. So the lecturer can insert prompts within their text whereby the um, listener, the audience, the student is invited to think about what's being said in some way, to disagree with it, um, to elaborate it, to argue with it. In which case, will the media of lecturing um, moderate this experience? Will the video lecture uh, disturb or extend the experience of inviting that kind of implicit conversation? So in the remaining part of this uh, presentation, I want to describe two or three ongoing pieces of work. Sadly, they are ongoing rather than mature and complete. Um, but they resonate with this perspective um, on thinking about the lecture as an educational practice. So I want to talk about the interpersonal sociality of a video lecture, the design of the format that supports or denies that. I want to say something about the cultural context of a video lecture, um, highlighting it so that we think about it in terms of an embedding that it has within a larger educational structure. And then in the end, I want to return to the interpersonal dimension by looking at the video lecture in relation to um, or ways that we might structure 
uh, student as collaborative agents. Let's start from um, some thoughts about the visual design of lectures. This may be something that some of you have been involved with. Um, Louis Schofield and I, um, in thinking about this, harvested a large number of lectures from publicly available MOOCs. What we were interested in was looking at the kind of design decisions that had been made when it had been decided to, to present material in a lecture format in the digital environment. And after looking at very many of these, we kind of organized them into a, a rough sort of taxonomy, a kind of natural history of the online lecture. Now, I, I'm not going to, to dwell on this. What, what you might expect and, and what might be interesting to do is to relate different formats of this kind with engagement or with um, learning outcomes. And there are people who are circling around that, that issue. What, it, what we were more interested in is something that's kind of preparatory to that, just thinking about how do decisions that we make about video lecture design potentially bear upon the capacity of the audience, the student, the listener, to achieve some level of mutuality with the lecturer. I think quite a useful term here is, um, borrowed from developmental psychology really, mainly, is uh, intersubjectivity. A kind of mutuality in which we expect the participants to be monitoring and to be reading the intentions and the invitations of the other. So reaching a kind of um, psychological resonance that supports uh, the sense of being party to a conversation. And we felt that these examples revealed what might sometimes be difficult, although often I suspect overlooked decisions about how you integrate the voice within the broader context of sort of video presentation. So we thought, well, you could talk about lecture, the staging of lectures, if you like, as being, when they are videoed in form, as, as having certain um, uh, imperatives for design. So for example, um, the designer, the editor, uh, might engage in various kinds of cross-cutting in putting together a lecture, in which case the agency of the participant, the listener, is um, taken from them because now their attentional focus is being managed external to themselves. It's a job that the editor chooses to uh, take responsibility for. And then we also felt we saw a kind of problem of what we call modality alignment that, um, again, design fails to accurately render what the lecturer is trying to signal as their momentary attention. So this would obviously be most um, uh, striking within a context where we're talking over visual material, as I'm doing now, and how attitude and gesture and visual orientation and body movements and positions and so on would help um, render the, uh, the the speaker's uh, attention at particular moments within within the lecturing discourse. Issues of depth of field. So there's something about the video that renders the lecturer more distant. I mean, literally, because size constancy mechanisms are not active to bring them forward and make them more prominent within that sense of presence that you're trying to create. Um, some lectures would have jump cuts in which things would be inserted um, post hoc, or there would be enforced discontinuities of other kinds in time and space that, again, disrupt that sense of being party to an unfolding narrative. Because the video lecture is probably something that is a little time and labor intensive to create, then it's something that you want to get right. And so um, that means special care is taken to maybe extract from it some of that improvised quality, some of that spontaneous quality um, that maybe we don't risk uh, retaining when it's something that is going to be shelved and reused and so on. So um, that could be an issue. And then finally, um, 
Video lectures tend not to have a decor, um, although I know there's much, um, much discussion at the moment about the way people place things in the background of their video, as um, you won't find much in the background of this one, but uh, it, it is something for which decor is possible. But usually it's a kind of placeless anonymity that one uh, experiences as someone attending a visual, visual lecture. And most of these matters fracture potentially the effective intersubjectivity um, that we are, we should be striving to achieve between the speaker and the listener. And this last point about decor, although in some sense may seem trivial, it is something that is, in our experience in talking to students anyway, it's most commonly articulated as a kind of um, case for attendance. It's a community experience. Students will often say that what's important for them in being uh, an attender at lectures is that they are reminded of the community to which they belong and they are able to understand that a lot of other people like themselves may be struggling with this material or intrigued by this material but have a relationship with this material as part of a sort of common shared experience. So the decor is not entirely trivial. The fact that we gather in the same place with the same people in the same sort of configurations is something that creates a strong sense of community and maybe is something, again, that can be fractured by the way we approach um, the design of the recorded lecture. Now, um, so one of the things that worried me about doing a exercise of that kind um, that is to say, taking the individual lecture and sort of deconstructing it in terms of the way in which design um, imposes constraints or affordances on the listener's experience. One of my reservations was that actually lectures don't exist in this isolated way most of the time, at least if you are, um, if your concern is with practice within higher education, then maybe we should be talking about um, lecturing rather than lectures. So lectures have um, a, they are embedded within a wider educational um, practice and we would be unwise to analyze them as kind of isolated episodes. So I want to move towards thinking about what it means to orient towards the lecture as part of a bigger structure in that sense. Now my credentials for commenting on this are limited. Um, I've spent a lot of time reading the literature on lecture capture, um, actually on behalf of my university. It's not a very inspiring literature, but I think I've got my head around it. But I've also talked to um, a, a cross-section of lecturers within my own institution, trying to get underneath their own understanding of how this form of activity fits to their discipline, and how it fits to what they're trying to achieve as educators. In the course of doing that, I've looked at the um, VLE logs that have been um, associated with the courses that these lecturers teach. Now, I had a particular reason for doing that. Um, it seemed to me that if you implement lecture capture, what you're doing is extending the demand on the student in terms of how they spend their time. It's an extra thing to go to a lecture and then subsequently to revisit it. The fact that you can revisit it um, is a particularly strong reason for promoting lecture capture. It gives students an opportunity to return to material and uh, review it and um, makes greater sense of it than maybe on a first encounter. But on the other hand, um, as a mix, as part of the mix of resourcing for a course, it may potentially therefore steal time from how you invest in other resources. It's kind of thinking about lecture capture as a zero sum game. If you implement it, is it at the expense of how students spend time engaging with other resources that are made available to them? So uh, here are some um, illustrations from our exploration of that idea, which involved looking at courses 
in the year in which lecture capture was introduced and then thinking how the students engagement with the course resources more widely compared with um, those deliveries of the course prior to lecture capture. I hope that makes sense, but let's look at an illustration. Here, is, here are two diagrams that show for individual students in rows um, the, the number of times are hidden and turned into merely uh, colored blocks, but in columns, the day by day unfolding of a course, in this case, in plant science. And on the left hand side, you see how frequently the students on this course engage with lecture capture, uh, recorded video lectures. And uh, these are organized from the most intensive user down to the least intensive user. So, Although this is a course in which probably more than average students use lecture capture, it's probably fair to say that it was not widely embraced. Whereas here we see um, the students' interaction with all other learning resources that were made available to them on their uh, virtual learning environment. So it's making, it's seeing whether the emergence of this kind of appetite is at the expense of uh, engagement with this kind of set. So we're looking at courses in those terms. Here's an example from economics. Um, here you see the use of lecture capture. This is um, uh, in a given week, the percentage of the class that invoked the video lectures. And here you see a kind of visual representation of that, which you can, I'm sure, match the two together. This is actually a vacation period here. So it's a, um, uh, uh, one semester course. And then um, we look down here at the um, lecture capture year, which is this orange line, and the year before when lecture capture was not available. And this is a, a, a generally the pattern we found. There the, the is not at this stage in a student's experience of the resource anyway, um, a strong, uh, no statistically significant stealing of time from uh, other resources that are made available for students um, studying this economics module. And then another example from geography, uh, again, looking over three years with the black line here showing the kind of baseline pre-lecture capture um, engagement levels with BLE resources. So I suppose the things to notice are that lecture capture video lectures are not widely used. This says nothing about how long a session a student might spend with a lecture, of course, but it, it indicates the frequency with which they might be fired up um, for some kind of viewing. And they don't seem to be stealing time from um, other materials that students are invited to study. Here's a, a finally a, a course in quantum physics. Um, again, uh, looked at over three years with the blue line, um, no, both the blue and the orange line representing um, BLE resources across the two semester session of studying this module. So you might say, well, this is encouraging. Um, it's not stealing time. Somebody slipped in there, okay. It's not stealing time from somewhere else. Um, Let's have a, a look at another point that Professor Jessup makes in her exposition on the digital, the changing digital environment university. Students vote with their feet, she claims, and when there is no value added to engagement, interaction, or inspiration, they flick on their laptops, blah, 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 fast forwarding when they're bored. And so the idea is that um, the skeptic about lecturing is um, offering as an alternative, as an attractive alternative, the video encounter instead, and arguing that um, this is what the appetite of the student, the modern student is, and this is what we can expect to happen. Actually, the literature doesn't really support this. Um, the lecture, the literature is very varied. Um, you find studies in which attendance falls, and you uh, find study where attendance stays constant. And I think the important message of that is the unsurprising one maybe, that actually um, different courses, different styles of lecturing, different disciplines um, 
are more or less suitable to the notion that you would want to revisit and review a lecture. And maybe also the stage of your um, degree journey may influence uh, how appropriate it is or how attractive it is to return to a lecture and, and revisit it. And the odd thing about the literature is that it seems kind of blind to these subtleties which might be very important in determining the attractiveness of uh, the video lecture as a, as a resource. So if you read the abstract of most studies, they don't usually even specify what the discipline was that the researcher studied. They don't usually specify what year of study the students were in. So they're curiously blind to the texture of uh, a course in which um, lecturing is embedded. All of the staff we spoke to and all of the students we've been speaking to more recently were pretty positive, in fact universally positive, that the live lecture remains something that it was important to protect. And the way in which this appetite was expressed was, well, broadly as follows, I guess. Um, one was something I've already mentioned. There was a way in which an occasion of this sort consolidates the sense of community that's to say the cognitive and social solidarity um, that arises from taking part in this shared experience. Secondly, they would cite the way in which a lecture creates an opportunity for interacting with and querying the lecture in real time. What they didn't do, I guess, was invoke such abstractions as intersubjectivity that I was talking about a moment ago. They didn't refer to the fine texture of implicit communication that the lecturer might be striving for, yet I think they seemed uneasily aware that there was something in the live event that did something to the sense of communication that was denied by the video version. So I'm thinking that what I was saying earlier about the management of intersubjectivity is, it is actually an important ingredient for what it is that creates engagement. And then thirdly, I think this is very important. I mean, lectures were recognized as kind of junctures on a pathway, uh, a temporally organized and resource integrated study journey, if you like, temporally organized because it imposes a sort of discipline on your study um, practice. Um, it keeps you in a sort of useful step. And resource organized meaning that it becomes what, what is heard becomes our curriculum. This is our curriculum and it fits together in a sensible way that we have some ownership of. So lectures certainly welcomed um, aspects of lecture capture and the video lecture as an inclusion issue, but then they worried a lot about how it could tempt the student sojourner off their study route. Um, so the exposition of a lecture was always identified as something that was distinctively integrated with a local curriculum. And um, the student risks sort of violating that integrity by using the medium as a kind of binge study uh, opportunity and lecturers who perceived loss of attendance worried not so much about having small audiences but worried about the practice they felt students were adopting of coming back to lectures for the first viewing in a kind of binge type way um, often before assessment of course but uh, uh, later on in such a way that it disturbed the natural unfolding uh, narrative of the study that the teacher was trying to create. So that the capturing of lectures evidently is controversial. Uh, I mean, one thing you find in the literature is quite a large number of studies in which the student perspective is compared with the teacher perspective. And um, uh, particularly in the social sciences and humanities, there's a great deal of skepticism about the value of going in this direction. If we look at the final paragraph I want to lift from Professor Jessup's recent article, um, 
we find a very um, welcome acknowledgement that what it is students might be seeking within it a higher educational context is some sense of close contact with lecturers and other students um, as an ingredient sort of well indeed the very stuff of learning and I tried to argue earlier that that closeness of contact was something that has to be managed carefully um, and is a kind of nuanced achievement when we think about the design of um, video lectures and I'm arguing in thinking about the captured lecture that there is a danger of students acquiring practices of consuming those lectures in ways that disturb the sense of community that we're striving to create within the student experience and the sense of narrative that would be important in the um, unfolding curriculum. But I want to turn finally to a further way in which um, sociality of lecturing can be celebrated and particularly how it can be maybe uh, enriched within this kind of COVID world of um, more intense digital education. So let me say something about what I'm calling lecture supported collaborative learning now many of you here all of you here probably will be um, familiar with the acronym CSCL because that of course stands for computer supported collaborative learning so I'm borrowing that and saying well what about lecture supported collaborative learning now not something that we are uh, seeking within the episode of the individual lecture but something that we're seeking from making the lecture a resource for collaborative learning. Now often it seems to me in the CSCL literature 